Hi guys, welcome back to CNG Productions, my name is Tom and yeah, this is an introductory video for the tabletop skirmish mob football extravaganza that is Guild Ball by Steamforge Games. Now in this video we're going to talk through the mechanics, the card structure and also the gameplay of the game in as simple terms as I possibly can. Now Guild Ball is traditionally played with six players on a pitch, however for the purpose of this video we're going to have three players from the butchers and three from the fishermen going at it on a slightly smaller pitch just so it's easy for you to kind of get to grips with mechanics. Now each player has quite a detailed card so what I'm going to do to break it down for you is in the first turn I'm simply going to talk you through attacking, passing, movement and kicking which is the real core of the game. In the second turn we're going to start using character abilities and character plays as they are known um, to kind of interact with attacks or status conditions and things like that. And in the third turn we're going to use the back of the cards which is the character trait so hopefully that will structure things for you really nice and easily so by the third turn onwards you will see fully what these players are able to do. Now today's game is only going to be played up to 10 points whereas traditionally it's 12 again just for speed and ease and I will do my best to talk you through everything that you need to understand the main mechanics. If you have any questions at all, you are more than welcome to comment on this video, and if you do like it, please do subscribe. I have put tons of links in the description below, should this pique your interest. Everything from where you can get the resources for free on the Steamforge website, to our favourite playlists from our own channel, to excellent other online resources that you might want to look at, such as the Facebook group, such as friends at other channels, such as homebrew mechanics and alternative ways to play the game. So ideally, this video will form the first port of call for you to get the grips of the mechanics and then use it as a jumping point with all those links in the description below. So, without further ado, we will get onto it in a sec. So here is the first team that we're going to be using for today's demonstration game, and they are the Butcher's Guild, who are a takeout heavy, stabby team who like to focus on getting early kills in the game so they can have a numbers advantage for later turns. They are led by the player in the centre, Ox, who is the Master Butcher, who excels at damage output and also encouraging his teammates and subordinates to deliver even more damage. The player on the left hand side is Boiler, the Apprentice, who is excellent at finishing the job and going for the killing blow on players, whereas on the right hand side we have the Butcher's only real striking option, the second generation star Brisket, who is the player that you really want to have the ball. Now this team are going to focus on kills very early on, but look to see if they can get the ball to Brisket either at the start or at the end of the game to wrap it up or get an influence advantage. And facing off against the Butcher's Guild is the polar opposite, lithe, dodging, goal scoring focused fisherman team. They are led by the Captain Shark in the centre who is a superstar captain who focuses primarily on goal scoring, as does the player on the left, Angel, who can score from a very, very long distance away and also keep herself out of trouble. To the right hand side we have Siren who will be an excellent demonstration of a character play focused player who can manipulate opponents and teammates to get the ball or make them do actions that will benefit your team. So we will go to the kickoff and we will look at how this team lines up against the Butchers. So at the beginning of the game each player needs to roll a d6 and they will then be able to decide which player has initiative by receiving the kickoff. So in this scenario, the fish player has got six, the butcher's player has got one, so it'll be up to the fish player to decide whether they want to kick or receive the ball. In most cases, it is positive to receive the ball in the first turn, because it will later generate some momentum from passing and also set up a goal scoring opportunity potentially. However, kicking off with a particularly strong player will allow them to get further up the pitch and then be in a prime place to attack. But in this occasion, the Fisherman footballing team are going to elect for the Butchers to kick to them. So, as the team who are kicking the ball, it is the Butchers who line up their players first, and they must also elect a goal kicker to kick out the ball over the halfway line. They deploy along this line here, and as you can see, Brisket has been given the ball to kick off. The receiving team, the Fish in this case, then get to deploy their players to respond to this. So it will allow you to put your best receivers in position or potentially deny a flank. But as you can see, quite simply, the fish have just lined up in a straight line. And that simply leaves us to do the kickoff. So for the butchers, they get to make a base move with their kicker and then boot it. So quite simply, Brisket has two move characteristics on her movement stat. 
it's six inches and eight inches. Now six inch is the base move, eight inch is a sprint. So we can move up to six inches, but she really doesn't need to go quite that far. So we're simply gonna move her four inches up to this position here, and then we're gonna make the kick off. Now we want the ball to go over the halfway line. If it fails to go over the halfway line, the fisherman players can give it to whoever they want to start with. So ideally we wanna kick it quite deep across the line here. Now to decide a kick, we look at the two stat uh, statistics that are in the kick stat, which is a number followed by a distance. You will see the distance, the right hand part, is eight inches for brisket's kick, and the number is the amount of dice to decide whether she is successful. So in this example, brisket has three slash eight inches. So we get to roll three dice to decide whether she is accurate with this kick, and I'll explain what that means in a second. So let's just have a look. She is very accurate with that, all of them. Now to secure a successful kick, you must get a four or above. So basically a 50-50 chance on one of the dice, not added together on one single dice. But as you can see, a six, a four and a six, any of these results would have been successful. What that allows us to do is when we scatter the ball now using this widget at the top, if we don't like the result of where it goes, we are allowed to re-roll it. However, if that kick would have failed, it would still go over the line, but we'd have to accept the first result. So I'm gonna use a green die for direction and a red die for the distance, and we will see where it goes. It's gonna go along the one, and it's gonna go three inches, which is, using a three inch widget, just to roughly that position there. And that is comfortably over the halfway line. We have not gone outside of the boundaries of this pitch, so I think Brisket can be very happy with that. And we will now go to influence allocation for the first turn, and I'll explain how that works next. So as you can see here, each character has now got some colored tokens in front of them, and this is designated as influence. Now each character has an inf stat on the right-hand side of their playbook, and there are two numbers divided by a slash. The first number is the amount of influence the player generates, and the second number is the amount that they can hold. Now, each team here generates eight influence, which makes it nice and even, four for the captain and two for the other two players. Now, this influence can be given freely to any player up to the maximum they can hold. So realistically, you could have one player who has quite a lot of influence, captains quite often, and some players who have none. But for the sake of this first turn, I've given each player the amount of influence that they actually generate, which is a safe thing to do if you're playing the game for the first time or if you're just getting used to a team. Now players need to use influence to do all manner of actions that we will cover in this video, such as sprinting, kicking, or even character plays. For the first turn of this match, we are simply going to focus on movement, kicking, and attacking. We will not be using character plays until turn two, just to ease you into it, or character traits, which will come later. So the first team to allocate their influence is the team with initiative, which in this case is the fishermen. They will go first as they have received the ball. Then it is the turn of the players who are going second, i.e. the butchers. This allows teams to react to each other's influence allocation and also prepare or think about where they're going to go after that first activation. Now, because this is the first turn of the game, no player starts with any momentum. However, in subsequent turns, the player who does not have initiative, i.e. the one that is going second, will get one of these, a piece of momentum, which allows them to do things like counter-attacks and special actions, but we will come on to that when we generate them. So to start with, let's go with the fisherman's first action. For our first turn, we are gonna activate Siren, who currently has two influence available to her. Now Siren has got a range of actions that she can do here, but ideally we want her to get the ball and kick it to the captain shark so that we are able to do some more things with it later in the turn. Now Siren has got two movement characteristics. She's got a seven inch base move, so she's very quick, or a nine inch sprint. She can move the base move freely, or she could spend one to sprint nine inches. Now we wanted to pick up the ball, so what we're all gonna do is move our base move. As long as Siren moves within an inch of the ball, she can pick it up. So as long as any part of her movement snakes within an inch of the ball, she can grab it. So quite simply, we're just gonna move straight ahead and you can sprint in different directions, you don't have to go directly forward, but we are just gonna make a base move seven inches to this position here, and she will snap the ball, and that is a free action for Siren. What we're then gonna do is 
attempt a kick to shark. So Siren, you'll notice on her card in the corner, has a six inch kick using three dice. So what we're gonna do is spend one of our influence to attempt that kick. So again, we need a four or above for this to work. And we get a one, which is a miss, a three, which is a miss, but fortunately, we have got a four, and we only need one success for it to work. So that ball will make its way to shark, and we will earn something called momentum, which is this token here. Now, as mentioned, momentum is a currency for special actions in the game. We could do some things with it at the moment, but rather than overcomplicating, we're just gonna keep hold of it, because momentum also gives you an advantage at the end of the turn when you decide who will go first next. And with that, Simon has got one left on her, which she's not really gonna use. She's quite happy in the midfield, sitting there comfortably, and we will go over to the Butcher's Vera first activation. Now, often in a first turn, you will find that players will jockey for position, and the Butchers can't really do much at the moment because they're gonna to struggle to get to one of the Fisherman players. So we're gonna go with Boiler, who has got two influence allocated to him. And we're gonna go with a sprint action. So again, if you look at Boiler's card, his movement has got a six inch base move or an eight inch sprint. Now eight inches is conveniently the distance between the deployment line and the halfway line. So he's gonna spend a single point to sprint eight inches to stand on the halfway line here. And this is ideal for the Butchers because it will get them ready to do some attacks next turn. His other influence will stay unspent just for this turn until we start doing some more complicated things with character plays and we will move back to the Fisherman. So we will go on to the Fisherman here and we're gonna go with Shark and as is the case with this first turn, it's probably gonna be some influence that we do not spend. Now Shark is also gonna go for a sprint action because he's got a seven inch base move and an iron inch sprint. So out of his four influence on him, he's gonna spend one to sprint about eight inches just to this position here. And he will also take the ball with him. Now this puts Shark in a really good midfield position for him to be able to kind of control the battle as it goes on later. But what he would like to do is try and kick the ball back to Angel to generate some more momentum and also maybe set up a goal scoring run. So he's gonna spend one to have a kick back to Angel. Now as you can see on, Dice's, on uh, Shark's card, not Dice's, he has got four dice over eight inches, so he's pretty reliable as a striker. So we'll see if he makes it. And he does. We've got a two, a one, and two fours. So all we need is one of those successes to knock it back to Angel. Now, just in case you are unsure, in case you have a dice roll that fails, let's say Shark, for example, was unsuccessful in that dice roll. What we would use would be the same scatter dice, uh, scatter template that we used for the kickoff, and we would put it on Angel and see where the ball went and measure that new pathway. So let's imagine it went out here, we'd measure a pathway along here. If the ball still crosses the intended target, we are successful, um, we just don't generate any momentum, but if it goes wide, that is where the ball ends up. Now, we have generated our second point of momentum here but I'm gonna introduce you to one of the first tricks that you can use this for. Momentum, once a kicker's been successful, can be spent immediately to either give the kicker or the receiver a free four inch dodge. Now a dodge is a move that will not incur any damage if you pass over someone. It's an ideal type of movement because it allows you to get out of trouble or move further up. So actually we're gonna spend this point of momentum and out of the two, we're gonna to elect to give Angel a four inch dodge straight forward. So it's out of activation movement for Angel, which is ideal because it sets her up to potentially run down the pitch and maybe even go for a goal scoring effort. Now momentum can be used for plenty of other things that we will cover as we come along. But to start with, you've seen that you could have moved Shark, you could have moved Angel with the four inch move, or you could have just kept hold of it. And these abilities are called pass and go, um, or pass and move, is it? A give and go. Um, but yeah, Angel has moved up and we will go and see how the Butchers respond. Okay, so in this activation, we are gonna go with Brisket. I'm gonna introduce you to attacking. Now, each player has got something called a melee range, which is underneath their name. And you'll see that Brisket is one inch, which is represented by this little widget here, which basically means that Brisket needs to be within one inch of her target to be able to attack. 
Now, most players in this game have got one inch melee ranges, apart from Shark and Siren, who have two inch melee ranges. Now, Brisket has got a six inch move and an inch sprint, as we've established. And unfortunately, she is just out of her base range to walk up to Siren and attack. Now, she could run up and then attack, which would cost her one influence for the run and one influence for the attack. However, there is a type of attack in the game called a charge where she can spend both for the run and the attack and get a bonus for it. Now, a charge has a few special rules. It has to be done in a straight line. You have to be able to finish your attack within your melee range, obviously, and you will gain four additional dice to your attack, which I'll explain in a second. So Brisket is going to spend her two and charge up into this position here to attack Siren. Now, Siren has got options here. She could potentially take some defensive actions with her momentum, but we will look at that next turn. So quite simply, we're going to go with an attack. So Brisket's player card has a attack value, which is her attack, of four dice that she is able to use to try and hit Siren. As mentioned, if she charges, she also gets four extra dice to represent her kind of barreling in. Now, Brisket is going to aim to roll these eight dice and get results that are above Siren's defense value, which is a four plus. So we're gonna give them a quick roll and we'll see what we get. We have got many, many misses. That is poor by Brisket, look at that. She has unfortunately missed with seven of those shots, but has secured one successful hit. Now, if Siren had armor, you would actually take the armor value away from the successful hit. So if she had armor, she would actually take this success away. But unfortunately for Siren, she does not. Now, Brisket has secured one net hit, which will allow her to take a result off her playbook. Now, each playbook is divided into columns and each column is representative of a successful hit. So because Brisket secured that one successful hit, she can pick one of the values off her first column, which is either one damage or a tackle. Now obviously Siren doesn't have the ball, so she can't do a tackle. So Brisket is going to take the one damage, which will reduce Siren down to nine health points. The coloring on the playbook represents whether the action will give you momentum or not. So you'll notice that one has got no coloring behind it, so that does not generate Brisket any momentum. However, if it was colored red in the background, like her second column two damage, it would then also generate a point of momentum, which is what the butchers like to do. So if you imagine that was two hits, we could have potentially picked an option from the second column, such as that two damage. There are other things that can be unlocked in the playbook, but we will come on to those as we feature them. But for now, we will go back to the fisherman's team. So we move over to the Fisherman's last activation of this turn and Angel, who currently has the ball, is not quite in range to go for a goal scoring run. So she is going to aim to try and generate some more momentum to hopefully win the roll off at the end. Now she could walk up to Boiler and attack him, but unfortunately her attack value of 4 is quite low and she would be struggling to hit Boiler, let alone damage him. Whereas if she were to charge, she could potentially get some more dice. Now she could run past Boiler, but unfortunately if she runs out of his melee zone once she's entered it, he will get something called a parting blow, which we will look at next turn. So quite simply, Angel is going to follow Brisket's lead from the previous activation, and she's going to charge up to 8 inches, but not really that far, just to this position here, using her 2 influence for that charge. As mentioned, she has got 4 tack base, and she gains 4 for the charge. Now she is aiming to hit Boiler on four pluses. And Boiler also has one armor on him because he's a bit more defensively prepared than Siren is. So that means Angel will have to take one dice away from her successful net hit. So we will see how she does. See if she rolls better than a brisket did. So we are after four pluses there in that dice roll. So I will just remove the misses. And it looks there that we have got three successful hits. But as mentioned, we take one away for the armor value of one, which leaves us with two successful hits, which allows Angel to access 
two columns of her playbook. She can pick any result, any single result, from the first two columns. Now looking at her playbook, she could do one point of damage, or you might see that there are some arrows. Now an arrow to the left represents a dodge, and for each arrow represented, it is an inch of dodging. So you can see there is a non-coloured in, i.e. non-momentous, two inch dodge that she could use to move forward or there is a momentous push dodge, an arrow to the right representing the push, an arrow to the left representing the dodge. And that is momentous, and that is the result we're gonna take. Each result still creates two inches of separation, so it will keep us out of Boiler's melee range, and it will also generate us one of these, which puts us on two momentum. So quite simply, what Angel will do is push Boiler an inch just to that position there, and she's just going to scoot an inch to that position there with the ball, which will keep her relatively safe, hopefully, and also allow her to potentially run on goal next turn. So that is it for the fisherman, and we will see what the butchers do last. And here we go for the final activation of the first turn with the butchers, and we're going to go with the captain Ox. Now, unfortunately for Ox, all of the sneaky fishermen are outside of his seven inch charge and one inch melee range, so eight inch effective range. Both Angel and Shark are unfortunately too far away for him to be able to do anything of note in terms of damage. So at this point, he's got a choice. He can either defend the goal or he could potentially block a path or prepare for another attack next turn. So what Ox is going to do is he's gonna spend one of his influence so simply make a sprinting action along this pathway in front of Angel, which will force her to have to react to him at the end of the turn. Now with that turn over, we will now roll off to decide who will go first next. Now the way this works is both players will roll a d6 and they will each add their momentum number to it. So the fishermen, if you recall, have already secured two points of momentum in their favour, whereas the butchers unfortunately have secured none. So the fisherman will add two to whatever this dice roll is. So let's see how it goes. There you go, the fisherman win it outright. So we've got a six, which will become eight, and a four for the butchers, which means that the fisherman's player has the choice of whether they would like to go first or second. Now I know most of you will think, well why would you ever want to go second? If you go second, you will be given a point of momentum to start the turn with. However, the fishermen are quite keen on trying to get an early goal in, so what they are going to do is elect to go first before the butchers can get hold of them. And that means the butchers player will get an early piece of momentum. So once again, we will go to the influence allocation. It's also during this maintenance phase that you would resolve any conditions, but we have none on any of the players so far, so we will come on to that shortly. So we will just go to the influence for turn two. So this is how the influence allocation looks for the second turn. And you can see each player has now got slightly varied amounts of influence, not just the amounts that they are generated. For example, Angel has got her full stack of four now, and basically we have taken a point from Shark and from Siren to facilitate that. Shark has got three and Siren has got one, so it's very clear the fish player is gonna try and get a strong showing from Angel at the start of the turn to try and score a goal. However, the Butchers have gone for a slightly more balanced approach and Ox has given one of his generated influence to Boiler to be able to use. And what this will allow the Butchers to do is when the ball comes back out, they are able to respond in a balanced fashion and whatever the fish do, they will have to face someone who can deal a fair bit of damage. So we will go to the first activation of the second turn, which will be the Fisherman with Angel. So we're going to start turn two with Angel, who is obviously looking to try and score a goal into this token at the back. Now, when you are shooting for goal, you need at least one momentum as tribute to get the audience on side for that shot. And obviously the Fisherman player is starting with zero, whereas the Butchers have got one. So Angel is going to need to find a way to generate some momentum. Now the best way to do this will be attacking Ox, and Angel's got a choice. She could walk up to Ox, who's got a one inch melee range, and try and see if she can get some damage that way. However, with her low tack, she is probably going to struggle. So what she is gonna to elect to do instead 
is spend two of her influence to charge at the butcher's captain. Now, as long as she is outside of her melee range, she is free to charge and she's not being engaged by anyone else who could get in the way. So quite simply, she is gonna to charge to this position here. Now, Ox has some options here because he has this momentum to play with. Now, with momentum, when you are being attacked, you can spend it to use a counter attack. Now, a counter attack is resolved very similarly to a normal attack. Uh, all it means is that you can't generate any momentum, but what Ox could do is potentially try and tackle the ball or knock Angel down. However, knowing that she is likely to resolve her attack first and will likely go for the push dodge or a dodge away, he is probably going to use the other way that you can spend momentum defensively, which is when you are charged and charged only, not normal attacks, you may spend momentum to increase your defense by one. It's called taking a defensive stance. So Ox with his three plus defense will actually spend this to go up to fours with one armor and the hope for Ox here is that Angel will fluff her rolls and will not be able to get that result she is looking for. So as before when we were charging Boiler we've got four dice for Angel and we've got four for the charge and we are looking for four pluses because of Ox's defensive stance. And let's have a look to see how that has done. So I'll take the misses away again. And you can see immediately there that's uh, had a decent impact on the roll. Ox has got, just roll that over, Ox has got one point of armor, which we will take away, which leaves two hits, which very fortunately for Angel is enough for her to get an item from her second column, which will again be that momentous push dodge action. And what she will do is quite simply push Ox forward and move herself forward towards the goal. That is her first action of this turn, and actually it puts her just outside of her eight inch kicking range. However, we're gonna introduce something called character plays now. A character play is in the bottom part of a player's card, and they are divided into a variety of abilities and skills which are kind of in keeping with a player. Now, Angel is a superstar striker, so she's got an ability called Super Shot, which adds both a dice and two inches of distance to her kick. Now character plays have a cost, it can either be an influence cost, or it could even be triggered off the playbooks. So if you've seen any symbols on your player's playbooks, that will be a way of unlocking it and we'll come on to that shortly. However, for now, Angel is quite simply going to spend one of her influence to grant herself the super shot ability. And this will stay with her until the end of the turn, which will now give her a 10 inch kick using a formidable 5 dice because her four inch kick uh, her four dice kick will now go up to five so she is going to attempt to score a goal so she will have to spend that point of momentum that she gained from attacking ox and we will see if she can get that four plus to secure a goal so that's her last point of influence to kick on goal five dice let's see how she does Ooh, very lucky she manages to secure a success uh, two successes actually she only needs the one, and that will score a goal for the fishermen, which will earn them four victory points, a point of momentum, and something called a goal influence, which is an influence which is added to the pool for the next turn, which you get to keep. So as you can see, goal scoring is very, very powerful and very useful. Now, Angel could spend that momentum she's just gained to do something called run the length, which is a four inch dodge away. And she's quite fearful of Ox. However, I think for the moment she will stay there and the fish will keep hold of that momentum should they need it. So what that leaves us to do next is to kick the ball out with the butchers and then go with their next activation. But there you can see a successful goal for the fish, 4-0 up. So once a goal has been scored, it's up for the fans to boot the ball back into play eagerly. Now, a player who has conceded a goal may put the ball anywhere within 10 inches of the center of their goal token and then roll a standard scatter, which can't be re-rolled as the ball is kicked in play. So again, we'll use two dice, green for direction and a red for the distance. And it will go in the five, five inches, which is basically going to lob the ball just to this position here. Now that is just outside of an inch of boiler 
and outside of an inch of Sharks. And neither one of those players are able to take possession of the ball straight away. However, what it will allow the Butchers to do is gain possession of it quickly and maybe even move it down. So we will go to their activation next. Okay, so we are going to go with the Butchers team next. And what Ox is going to do is he's going to try and pick up the ball and also achieve a charge at the same time. So he's going to aim for Shark, knowing that Angel is out of the picture, by spending two of his current influence running along this pathway here to snap the ball and ending that straight line just here. So he is within an inch of Shark, gaining the ball and also still having one influence there to play with. Now Ox is pursuing a charging action, which means Shark could potentially counter-attack or take a defensive stance. However, with momentum being such a precious uh, resource, Shark is just going to stand there and take it because he's quite a tanky captain. He can take a fair bit of punishment. So Ox has got a base tack of seven, very, very hard hitter, and also gains four for his charge. And he is looking for four pluses to hit Shark with the one armor to take away afterwards. So we'll see how he does. And that is quite a lot of hits for Ox. So if we take the misses away, we have got one that needs to be removed for armor. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which is the entirety of the length of Ox's playbook. Now Ox has a lot of choices here that he can go with. He could go for some momentous damage, potentially the momentous four, which is right at the top of his playbook. Or he could use some pushes, which are the right hand arrows near the beginning of his playbook. Or he could even freely trigger some of his character plays, which are the symbols, or even go for a condition, which is the knockdown, which would basically reduce Shark's ability to move and defend. Now, for the purposes of this one, I am gonna show you again the ability to activate character plays. So Ox is gonna take his sixth column non-momentous result of three damage, and you can see the two guild ball symbols now. The two symbols can only unlock abilities which have two symbols. So you cannot use the two symbols to unlock, say, they ain't tough twice. But what Ox will do is he will unlock the ability Butchery, which basically means that anyone who is attacking Shark this turn will gain one point of damage to any attack they do, as long as they are doing a damaging result, which is a highly useful ability. So that leaves Shark within Ox's uh, melee zone still, and still with one point to use. And Ox could potentially pass the ball away here. He could continue to attack, or he could even try and kick the ball upfield for someone to chase. But Ox, being the big brawling captain he is, is just going to go for another attack. So, spending this influence, we go to our base attack of seven. Again, Shark has the choice here. He could potentially counter-attack. He can't take a defensive stance because it's not a charge. But again, Shark is going to just take the punishment that he gets. So we're after four pluses with one armor. And you can see, there you go, dice rolling has leveled out. So if we take the misses away, that leaves two hits, but we'll have to take one away from armor, which will allow Ox to access something from the first value of his playbook. And what he is going to select is the momentous one damage result. However, because of butchery being placed on shark, that will become two points of damage, which will knock shark down two points of health. Now, there are ways that Ox can actually increase that damage, but we will look at that as we go into the third turn. But for now, you've seen the character play used and potentially someone like Boiler or Brisket could even continue to help out there. So we'll go back to the fisherman. So we're going to showcase um, something slightly different here. Now, Siren is not where she wants to be. She doesn't really want to be tied up with Brisket. She's got hardly any health on nine and she could potentially fall victim to some damaging plays. So Siren is going to choose to leave combat with Brisket. Now, this is quite a risk because it will mean that Brisket gets a free hit. But Siren knows comfortably that Brisket cannot do any think that will slow her down, such as a knockdown, which we'll be looking at shortly. 
So Simon is going to choose to leave Brisket's one inch melee, so she will leave it there and she's planning to move up to here to engage Ox. This triggers something called a passing blow. And basically Brisket gets a free hit, so that will be her four dice, but she also gets two extra to add on. Now Simon's hoping that her high defense of a four plus will protect her from the worst, but we'll just see how it goes. And we'll take away the misses. And Brisket is successful in securing three hits. Now, a parting blow will not generate momentum. It cannot generate any character play, so Brisket can't use her dirty knives, for example. And it can also not generate any repositions, i.e. dodges or pushes. So Brisket has got three hits and she is able to go up to her third column. Now, a result is activated as long as you can actually use one of the options. So if you look at her third column, you'll see she can do a two damage with a one inch dodge. Now, as I said, she can't do the dodge, but she can do the two damage part, which is a valid result. So quite simply, as Siren runs away, she's going to take two damage, which will knock her down to seven health. But she does get away freely, which will allow her to move to this position here. Now, Siren is one of the players on the Fisherman team who has a two inch melee range, as represented by this widget, which means that she can attack Ox without fear of him counter attacking her. Because he's only got a one inch melee, he can't quite reach. So, Siren is going to spend her influence to try and attack Ox. She has got three dice for her attack, but because Shark is stood up nearby and engaged in a fight with Ox, she also gains a ganging up bonus. Now, if Shark was knocked on the floor, or if he was not within melee zone, she wouldn't get the bonus, but she does for this action. And there's nothing that Ox can do about it. He can't defend because he can't um, counterattack, and she's not being charged. It's just a normal attack. So Siren is going to roll these four attack, aiming for threes with one armor. And she is successful in all of those hits, which is absolutely fantastic. And what she is going to do is to take the one away for armor. And she has got an option of anything from her playbook. She's only got three columns. Now, she could go for the tackle to get the ball off Ox. But what she's actually going to do is trigger her character play, Seduced, which is the double guild ball symbol. Now, Siren's Seduced ability would normally cost her three influence, which is the maximum she can take, but it can be triggered this way off the playbook. It says, target an enemy model, so it'll be Ox in this sense, will make a pass or attack without spending influence. Now, obviously, I don't want him to attack because he's going to be swinging at Shark, but I am going to ask him to pass the ball back to Siren. So this is resolved as a friendly character. So quite simply, Ox has got a three dice kick, and he's a friendly model, so he's not going to have any problems with other people engaging him, because technically for this action he's on my team. See if he's successful. He does get the one success, so Ox has kind of had his mind warped for a second, and he's going to freely pass that ball to Siren. Now this produces two interesting actions. First of all, we've got our point of momentum for triggering that momentous result off the playbook, and then we get a point of momentum for the pass and now as mentioned earlier I will probably want to use this to take a dodge because quite simply there is boiler and brisket nearby so Siren is going to spend this immediately just to dodge just backwards four inches with the ball just that she is out of range of potentially nasty actions and if brisket wants to come and get the ball off her she's going to have to spend a fair bit of her influence. So that was a very successful action by the fish, and we will return to the butchers. Okay, so we're going to go back to the butchers, and you can imagine they're getting really frustrated here with these slippery fish kind of keeping out of trouble and dodging away. We're going to go with Boiler, who is going to make a charge for two influence into this position here. Now, there's been quite a lot of charging in this game, and obviously you could walk in and just attack, but charging is very, very potent against high defense teams because you want as many dice as you can possibly get. So with that in mind, Boiler has got a tack of five. He gains four for the charge and he also gains an additional one because Ox is there to gang up. Now Shark could take his defensive stance here, but realistically the fish want to keep hold of the momentum so they can win the roll next turn 
and ideally get the ball back up for a second goal. So Boiler is rolling these dice. He is after fours with one armor against Shark. See how he does. And we'll take away the misses. And then the one for armor, which gives us four hits successfully. Now that will take us anything from Boiler's very varied play playbook. But we're going to go for the fourth column option, which is something called a knockdown. And basically, a boiler's hit Shark with such force, it's taken him off his feet. And this will allow us to do a variety of things that will assist the butchers. First of all, Shark's defence is now being reduced by one while he's on his backside. Secondly, Shark will have to forego his movement to stand up or spend a momentum to heal that condition when it is his turn. So it forces your opponent to spend resources. So it'll either keep Shark pinned down next turn because he'll have to forego his move, or it'll basically mean they spend that precious momentum they are protecting. So it's not too bad a condition to have on people. It also means that if a player has got the ball, you would actually scatter it using a large random scatter to see where it goes, but we don't have to worry about that at the moment. Boiler has got one attack left, so what he is going to do is swing again at the newly weakened Shark. Now Shark, because he's knocked down, is unable to actually counter-attack or anything. He is basically fighting and scrambling on the floor. So Boiler has got his five tack and his one for Ox being there, now hitting Shark on three pluses with one armor. And that is not too bad. So if we take the two misses away and one for armor, we have got three successful hits. Now again, Boiler has got a variety of choices, but what he's going to elect to take is the result on the second column, which is a momentous two damage which will actually become three because of Ox putting Butchery on Shark. So that will knock Shark down another three health, leaving him currently on 12. We will go back to Shark now and see how he responds this turn. So here we are with Shark, and Shark is in quite a predicament because we don't really want to be engaged with these nasty Butchers in a big fight, especially when Ox has managed to put Butchery on us and Brisket is nearby. So Shark is going to forego his movement to stand himself back up. Now, as I mentioned, he could use his momentum for that, but as soon as it is two momentum apiece, Shark really doesn't want to have to get rid of any because it might risk him losing the roll off. What he's gonna use instead is he's gonna give another example of paying to use an ability off his playbook, and he's gonna use something called Tidal Surge. Now, it has a six inch range, so realistically he could successfully use this on uh, Siren, who's just off camera down the side, but he's gonna use it on himself. And what this allows Shark to do, even though he can't move this turn, he can spend this three to make a four inch dodge. And what this will allow Shark to do is dodge himself forward, just so he's in a goal scoring position for the next turn, and also away from the potential dangers that Ox and Boiler together represent. And that is quite simply protected Shark a little bit longer and kept his HP going. Now he is only on 12 health. He could spend a momentum instead to heal his health. So you can either heal your conditions or your health each turn. You can't do both. Um, and it would be healing four HP. But for the moment, Shark's on 12. He's got a pretty good defense. It's probably gonna take quite a concerted effort from the butchers. So we're just gonna go to brisket on the other side. So for the final action of turn two, we're going to go with Brisket, and Brisket is just outside of her normal walking range to go and attack Siren. And actually, because she's annoyed with how slippery Siren has been, she's going to make a base move of six to get quite close to Siren, just to force the fish's hand next turn, and spend two of her influence to try and go with a character play. And she's going to go with the character play, Dirty Knives. Now this is two dice, so it's equal to the cost of the play. And she's gonna try and roll against Siren's defense to trigger this. Now, you do not need to take into account armor for character plays or ganging up or anything like that. It's simply dice equal to the defense. So it's equal to the cost of the character play against the defense. However, what I am gonna do, because it is only two dice and Siren is on fours, is I'm gonna spend momentum to do a new trick. And this is called bonus time. Now, whenever you work out your final dice that you can use for ability, you can spend a momentum to add an additional dice to that final total in what is called bonus times, kind of up your chances. 
Now I only need one of these dice to be four or above, which is Siren's Defense for the ability to hit. So hopefully that extra dice will assist. So let's see how we do. And we are successful, thankful for that. So the Dirty Knives ability does one damage to Siren, which will put her down to six health. It will reduce her defense by one until the end of the turn, so it's not really gonna do much in that case. But what it does allow us to do is the poison condition, which is going to become an annoyance for Siren. Poison does two damage in the maintenance phase at the end of each turn, or the start, depending on how you look at it, and will not go away unless it is healed using momentum. So what that allowed Brisket to do is potentially chip another two health straight off Siren, which we'll come to in a moment, and also force the fish to spend some momentum next turn. Speaking of which, we are at the end of the turn, so it is a roll off now to decide who will go first. Now the fishermen have two momentum and the butchers have one. So the fish will be adding two to their score and the butchers one. So we'll roll and see how we do. And they've both just shot off camera, but there you go. We have got a one for the butchers, which goes up to two and a four for the fish, which will go up to six and the fishermen will most definitely probably want to go first this turn, which will grant the butchers one point of momentum to start turn three with, whereas the fishermen's momentum will now be wiped, and so will these character plays, which we will take off and come on to next. So this is how things look at the start of turn three, and you can see that Siren still maintains that poison cloud from Brisket's Dirty Knives last turn, and has sustained two damage in the maintenance phase, which comes in between the turns. In terms of influence allocation, you can see the butchers have got their normal generated amounts with two on boiler and four on ox as they chase the kill in the center, and two on brisket should she aim to try and get a goal or a tackle. As for the fish, you've got two on angel, four on shark, and two on siren, so their standard loadout, but you'll notice at the bottom of the screen that extra goal influence that they gained to their pool for this turn and every turn onwards as a result of that goal that Angel scored. Now, for this third turn, we will be taking advantage of the back of characters' cards so I can show you their traits. And this is really where the personality of the characters come through. Some of them have quite a lot of rules on the back, some of them do not, some of them are relevant for this battle, some are not, but for the most part, they're relatively simple. Now, it would have affected earlier turns, some of these abilities, but to keep things straightforward, we're gonna count them from what they do from this turn onwards. So, we'll go to the first activation of turn three, which will be Siren. So, we're gonna go with Siren first, and as you can see by the widget here, she is comfortably outside of Brisket's one inch melee range, meaning that she is able to attack and move without fear of any passing blows or counter attacks from Brisket. So, seeing as she's got three influence on her, we are going to try and see if we can get an attack off. Now, this is gonna be quite difficult, because Siren only has attack of three, and we're aiming to hit Brisket on fours with one armor. So we will see if we can get any successes off these three dice. Unfortunately, that time, there were no successes at all, which is a little bit disappointing from Siren. However, we'll try again, and the aim of this would be to try and see if we can generate some easy momentum off Siren's playbook. Just so we've got some in the bag, should we want to shot a goal. So we're just gonna try again and it secures two successful hits there. So we take one away because of the armor and that will allow us our first column of Siren's playbook, which is either a single point of damage or a momentous one inch dodge. So we said we were going for the momentum. So we are gonna take that momentous one inch dodge and quite simply just move to that position there. Next up, Siren is going to move. She's got a seven inch base move, so she doesn't need to sprint. And she's quite simply going to move within passing range of Shark with the ball. No passing blows or anything because she is not staying or moving within Brisket's melee range. So Siren has got a three dice kick and she needs a four rubber. And she fails the kick, which is excellent because we can kind of show you how that will work. So that kick has gone towards Shark, but has not successfully gone to him. So we put our scatter template behind and I will roll, as always, a green for direction and a blue for the distance and we will see where it ends up. The direction is six and the distance is five inches. So that will mean the ball will end in this location at the top here. So actually it will change our ball's pathway along 
a line over here. Now if I just pick the marker up, you will actually see, if that's the final point just there, that the ball pathway will cross over boiler. Now if there are any intervening models, whether it's friend or foe along the ball path, they can choose to take possession of an unsuccessful kick. So in this type of instance, Boiler is going to take possession of that ball as it flies past him, but unsuccessfully goes to Shark. So that will show you what happens when a kick is unsuccessful. If it would have just gone into open space, that would be the way the ball lands. It doesn't scatter anywhere further. It would have just gone in the wrong direction. However, if it would have gone towards Shark and along his pathway, he could have picked it up. It just wouldn't have generated any momentum. So that is very disappointing for Siren that she has not managed to get the ball to her captain. You can imagine she's going to get a hell of a telling off because of it. So she has generated a point of momentum. And what I'm going to do is just demonstrate the healing mechanic of the game. So Siren is going to spend that one momentum to heal herself for health. Now in a turn, you can either choose to heal your status conditions or your health. You can't do both. And if you wanted to heal a friend, you would have to spend two momentum to heal someone within eight inches. And again, you can choose to either heal damage or status conditions. But in this instance, healing the four HP is better than healing the two damage that comes from poison each turn. But we will now move on to the butchers and see how they respond with this unexpected ball. Okay then, so we are gonna go with the butchers and it is going to be boiler. Now the first thing we're gonna draw your attention to is actually something that is on the back of Captain Ox's card. He has a passive ability, which is referred to as the owner, which is a four inch aura, which basically means it's always on and it is always four inches around him, including him. And it says, while within this aura, friendly guild models, that does include Ox, can gain plus one damage to character plays that cause damage and playbook damage results, which is why he is such a damage dealer, Ox. He makes everyone within four inches score a successful extra bit of damage whenever they hurt someone. Now that is always on, and as you can see, Boiler is comfortably within four inches of Ox. You can see the aura range round about here. So that's just something to make you aware of, because what uh, Boiler is going to do is he's simply gonna walk, easy six inch walk, around to engage Siren there within his one inch melee range. He's gonna take the ball with him. As we can see, he is within four inches of Ox. And Boiler is going to have a go at attacking Siren. Now, Siren is a beautiful creature, and that's not just me. She's actually got something on the back of her card, which basically means that she has a trait called Charmed Male, which Brisket also has, which allows her to gain plus one defense when being attacked by a character of the specified gender, in this case, a male. So Boiler's going to get plus one damage, but he's going to struggle to hit Siren because he's going to need five pluses, but he's going to go for it simply because he knows that there'll be no counter attack because the fish have no momentum. So we have five tack base for Boiler. However, he's going to need five pluses to be able to do some damage on Siren. But if he does do damage, he's going to add plus one to it because of Ox's aura. Hopefully that all made sense and it was all straightforward. So anyway, five pluses because of the charmed male trait. Let's see how he does. And as you can see there, that made a huge difference. If that would have been turn two when we were using the front of the cards, that would have been two successful hits. But unfortunately for Boiler, because Siren is so pretty, he has struggled to be able to do anything to her. So we're just going to move these dice away. And now Boiler has a choice. He could either swing again, or he could potentially try and kick the ball six inches over to Brisket, which is what he is going to attempt to do. And this brings in an interesting mechanic because when you are trying to kick a ball when you are being engaged, it does add some troublesome modifiers. So for example, Boiler has two kick dice available to him and he's going to attempt to kick it to Brisket. However, because he is being engaged by somebody, i.e. Siren, he actually loses one die. Now you can never go below one, but it means he's got a one dice kick available to him. Now, just to give you a bit more examples, let's say, for example, it was not Boiler who was being engaged, but it was Brisket who was being engaged. So the receiving character. What that actually does, it keeps your two dice, but it actually adds the difficulty by one. So he would need a five plus rather than a four. So if you are engaged when you are kicking, you lose a die. If the receiver is engaged, it adds one to the toughness test. 
If there is anyone along the ball path, for example, if there was someone stood here, along that straight path to brisket, it would also take a die away. So just to be clear, kicker engaged, lose a die. Someone on the ball path, lose a die. Receiver engaged, add one to the toughness test. I hope that makes sense just in case you have any questions that come when you're playing. So anyway, Boiler is down to his one dice because Simon is engaging. So he is going to take advantage of that momentum that they were given at the start to make that bonus time roll. So he gets to add one dice to it. So he needs a four plus because Brisket is free. And he has failed on that kick there. So we will see where it scatters. So again, same routine. We'll see where it goes. We'll put this around Brisket and green for direction. And that is one, sorry, six for direction and then an inch, which means the ball path will travel to this location here, which will clip over Brisket's base, and she will choose to intercept it. However, the Butchers will not gain any momentum, and that is that influence spent for the kick. So there you go, you've got two really good examples of what happens when kicks don't go particularly right. They could be intercepted, or they can go to your intended recipient, but you don't get the momentum for it. So we'll see how the fish respond next. So here we go to Shark, who is going to have to get his hands dirty and try and get the ball back from Brisket. Now Shark has got an issue here because he's aiming to charge with his 9 inch charge range and go straight line, because he has to go straight on a charge, to Brisket. But as you can see, if he did, he would overlap Boiler's melee range and would actually go through it and exit it, meaning Boiler could potentially get a parting blow, which could be a knockdown, which would really halt this charge. However, as long as you can get within your melee zone, a charge can go to a straight line to that location. So, Shark actually has a 2 inch melee, so if we were to put a template here, Shark only has to get into a place where his melee zone is acceptable. So if we move our 9 inch charge ruler and put it along this pathway, you can see that will allow him to move to a position where the charge is successful without crossing Boiler's melee zone, and that is exactly what Shark is going to go for. So he's gonna take two influence away for the charge. He has got a mighty six dice on his charge, so we will just grab the dice for that. Six here, and then he gets four additional dice to play with. Now Brisket, so we'll move him into position, Brisket has also got the charmed male trait that you just saw with Siren, which actually makes her one of the hardiest characters in the game, because it'll knock her from four defense with one armor up to five defense with one armor, which we'll see how Shark does with that, but at least he's got some influence to spare should this not go right. So, we need five pluses. And we, as you can see there, look lots of fours, but take all these away, We've got three hits there, and then we have got one away for armor, which will allow Shark to access the second column of his playbook, which will be a non-momentous tackle result, allowing him to take advantage of the ball. Now, Shark has already moved this turn, so he can't kind of run away. There is a potential option to kick it upfield and hope that Angel chases it, but at the moment, he's pretty solid with the ball. So actually, what he's gonna do is swing it again and see if he can get a momentous result. So we go to our six tack. However, Charmed Male continues to persist on Brisket's card. So we need fives with one armor again. And as you can see, we get two hits, which will go down to one. And that will be a momentous one inch dodge for Shark. And he is simply just gonna dodge zero inches, which is a new thing that you can do. So you can dodge or push up to the full distance. So Shark is just gonna take his momentum, but not actually move anywhere. And he's gonna go for one more round of attacks. For fives and one. And that's a lot better, look at that. Four sixes, that's what we want to see. Take one away is three successful hits. And that will allow him to trigger something called stagger momentously. So again, We'll get another point of momentum and it'll allow to trigger his character play stagger which will put brisket on minus one defense and that will end the fish's turn giving them two momentum to play with in the future so then we will now move to ox who feels like he needs to get some damage in here 
So he is going to walk up to base contact with Siren, just as his free base move. And he's going to spend one of his influence to have a round of attacks. Now Siren could counter attack here, but it would be a bit pointless because if she was countering, she would lose a die because of Boiler engaging her, meaning the best result she could get would be on her first column because you take one away for Ox's armor. And basically, you can only counter attack once against one model. So if Ox attacks, Siren can only counter attack against him. If Brisket attacks, you can counter attack against her. So Siren can only at most get one inch away. So she's just gonna have to take the hit, which is gonna be quite hefty because Ox benefits from his own aura. He's got seven attack base, and he would gain one for Boiler being there. But before we attack, I'm going to declare Ox's legendary play. Now his legendary play is referred to as Get 'em Lads, as you can imagine bellowing it across. Now Get 'em Lads is an additional six inch aura that stacks with the owner, which gives an additional plus one damage to results and also takes a point of armor away. Now the armor won't matter in Siren's case, but the damage will. A legendary play is often a captain's special move, but there are other players in the game who have access to it. It is completely free and a once per game ability, which goes away at the end of a turn. So you can imagine it's kind of that injection of power or pace that you need right when you need it. So Ox is invoking his legendary play for free and he is demanding an extra point of damage. So each of his attacks will be doing now plus two damage to the playbook results. He is still going to need fives to hit Siren because of her charm male trait, so we will see how he does. And if we just push them all into camera, you can see it was two successful results, which will be an option from Ox's second column of his playbook. Now he has got lots of damaging options that he could potentially go for here. However, I think to keep it nice and simple, he is going to choose to go for his momentous damaging result of one on the first column. But because of the owner and because of Get em Lads, that will become three damage, which will knock Siren down to five. And also generate a point of momentum. Again, second round of attacks, he's gonna go again. Same amount of dice. So you can see the amazing impact his legendary play had. And we get two successful hits again, which is going to be the momentous one, which will go up to three damage, thanks to the owner and thanks to Get em Lads, which leaves Siren, poor Siren, only on two health left. Again, Ox is gonna swing. And he, so let's see if he gets any hits. He does manage two hits again. So again, that is going to be the momentous one, which will go up to three, which is enough to take poor Siren out of the game for now. So we get a point of momentum for the damage that we did. And we also gain a point of momentum for successfully taking a player out, which is really, really useful as well as the two victory points, which brings the score to 4-2 now. Now Ox has got one point left on him, and I think Shark is out of range of any character plays. So that last one will have to be unspent, but you can see the potent damage the Butchers are capable of doing when Ox is using the back of his card, and it kind of adds to this character trait fluffiness of him kind of commanding people to hurt more. So the fish now will play her down until the end of the turn, so we will see how Angel responds. So a very simple activation for Angel, who's unfortunately just watched one of her teammates get taken out to the physicians on the side of the pitch. She can't really get involved in the match at the moment. She doesn't want to get in too much trouble. So she's simply going to spend one of her influence to sprint eight inches so that she is within eight inches of the goal, hoping to receive that pass so she can get a second goal in the back. So this one will be unspent. And we will go to Brisket for the final activation of the third turn. So for the final activation of this third turn, Brisket is not going to go and engage Shark because if she tackles him, she'll likely get counter-attacked with an easy tackle back. So what she's actually going to do is spend her two 
to attempt to throw some poison knives at Shark because that works so well on Siren, she might get successful here. So Shark's defense is a four plus. Brisket has two dice for her to aim for a success. We'll see how she does. And she gets a five and a two. So the two is a miss, but the five is successful, which will do a point of damage to Shark. It will poison him and it will also reduce his defense by one. Not that it will matter too much for it being the last activation. However, it will ensure that he gains an extra bit of damage at the end of the turn. So that will bring us to the roll off and the fisherman's team has two momentums. They're on plus two to their roll, but the butchers, thanks to that takeout, are on plus four momentum. So we'll see who goes first for the start of turn four. If I just push them up screen, We've got a three for the butchers and a one for the fish, meaning the butchers will win the roll off and they will probably elect to go first to see if they can get that ball back and maybe steal a goal. So we will go the influence allocation for turn four. So here's how things look at the start of the fourth turn. Now the first thing you'll notice is that Siren has came back on the pitch. Now you do still get her influence. What happens when a player is taken out is they return to the pitch in the next maintenance phase and they come back on something called their Icy Sponge token, which in Siren's case is five health. It's traditionally about halfway along the health bar. They can come on any board edge that is within your deployment zones, i.e. the sides or the very back, and they get to make a base move. So Siren has came on at the very back and made a seven inch move just to get back into the action. So as you can see, Shark has taken his two damage from his poison, which leaves him on nine health. And we have got three on him, three on Angel, and three on Siren. Again, using that goal influence on Angel just to add a bit of strength. You've just witnessed how damaging the Butchers can be when they get into combat. So as you can see, we're going for something slightly different this way. Ox is going to take his maximum cap of five influence, which will ensure a very strong turn for him, depending on which way he goes. However, there is not that much on Boiler and Brisket. So we will see who will be going first. So we'll go to the first Butcher's activation and it will likely be Ox. Okay, so the first activation of turn four is going to be the Butcher's and it is gonna be Ox. So the first thing Ox is going to do is he's gonna to attempt to get the ball back off Shark, but he's well aware of the fish having a point of momentum that they can use to counter attack. So the first thing Ox is gonna do is he's gonna use one of his influence to use a character play called Tough Skin and he's gonna use it on himself to grant himself an additional point of armor should that counterattack come. He is then going to elect to charge at Shark. So he's got a seven inch charge, he needs to get within one inch for melee. So we're going to take two away and we are going to charge along this pathway here. Now Shark has got a lot of choices here because potentially he could even get taken out by Ox due to the damage that Ox can do. But he knows that Ox wants the ball, so if Ox knocks him down, the ball could potentially be scattered away. However, Ox really wants the tackle, so what Shark is going to declare is a counter attack, because he's hoping that there'll be no damage and that essentially Ox will just try and take the ball, which is what he's aiming to do. So, if we just move these to one side, Ox has got seven dice to begin with, and then he gains four for charging. And don't forget, he's still got his owner ability, even if his legendary play has now gone. So we'll see how he does. Fours and one for Shark. And that is not too bad from Ox if we take the failed results away. And one for Armour. We have got a mighty five successful hits, which can be anything up to the fifth column which could be three damage, which would even go up to four thanks to the owner, or it could be what we are looking for, which would be the momentous tackle, which Ox is going to go with. So he's going to tackle the ball off Shark and take it there. However, Shark will now get his counter attack. So he has got his six tack base. He is aiming to hurt Ox with three pluses, However, there will be two armor to take off because of the tough skin ability. So, see how we do. And Shark has rolled very well, so that is one miss, and then we take two away from armor, is three successful hits. So what Shark is going to do 
is take the ball straight back. You can't gain any momentum from a counter-attack. So the dodges would be a little bit pointless. So you're simply going to demand the ball straight back in this kind of captain fight. Now it's still Ox's activation. So Ox is going to spend another influence to try and attack Shark again. So, four, five, six, seven. Now Shark can't counterattack for a second time. So this is just going to be something that he'll have to take. So we have got fours and one that Ox is after. And that is not too bad a roll. We have got three misses. Take one away. It's three successful hits. And that will be a momentous tackle again. So you can imagine these two toing and froing to get the ball. Now, what Ox is going to attempt to do is he's going to see if he can pass the ball to Brisket. And we're going to go for something referred to as a snapshot. So if I just get our measuring stick. Okay, and we are back with widgets because we're going to try and see if we can demonstrate something cool. So Ox is going to try and kick the ball to Brisket. However, he's got some issues with how he spends his influence. He has got to deal with the fact that Shark is both engaging him and engaging his target Brisket. So his normal three dice kick is going to go down to two and he's going to need a five plus on this kick to be successful because of his target being engaged. So, we get the five plus there, which is successful, which will nudge the ball to brisket and also generate us a third point of momentum. Now we're gonna go for something cool. We're gonna go for something called a snapshot, which is an out of activation strike. If a person receives the ball and they are within goal scoring range, they can attempt a goal. So brisket is gonna to attempt to score a goal here. However, there are two caveats to this. First of all, it costs you two momentum to do, and you need two successes on the kick. So Brisket's traditional three dice kick is gonna go down to two because Shark is engaging her. So what we're gonna do is spend the third point of influence to bonus time this kick. So we need two four pluses here. And we are fortunate enough to secure a six and a five, which will score a goal for the Butchers and also generate a point of momentum, which will bring the score to six, four. So there you go. You had a really good example of the challenges when you're trying to kick the ball within a crowded environment and also the awesomeness that is a snapshot. So the Butchers now gain their own goal influence to use next turn onwards. And we will go to the kick out. Okay, onto the kick out from that goal. And you can see 10 inches from the middle of the goal. We're gonna try and knock it out wide for the fish to get the ball up the pitch. So as always, green for direction. It's gonna go in the four, three inches, which will basically just pop it over here. So I move these templates away and we are now gonna go with Shark. Now I think Shark is probably gonna to have to take one for the team here and attempt to block off Boiler so he can't go and fetch the ball. So Shark is engaging Brisket, but is not engaged by her. However, he is being engaged by Ox. So we can't really leave Ox's melee zone without potentially being knocked down or causing trouble, but he can freely move away from Brisket. So what Shark is going to do is he's quite simply going to try and see if he can just walk around and move to a position where he's engaging Boiler but still being engaged by Ox. So if we just shuffle him to here, you can see if we just spin this around that he remains within Ox's melee zone. However, he is now engaging Boiler. And Shark is gonna spend one of his influence to try and have a round of attacks. So, you should be familiar with this pattern by now. We've got six tack base. However, we lose one because Ox is engaging and we are after Four plus defense with one armor against Boiler. So we'll see how we do. And that is two misses with the one point of armor. Is a successful two hits. And Shark is going to take a one inch momentous dodge. Now he will move with this one because what Shark can do is simply move an inch. So he is no longer being engaged by Shark, but he is engaging Boiler. He's going to attack again. Two, three, 
four, five, six. Full tap this time, fours on one. And no successful hits on that one, because we have the one and then the armor. And we'll go for one more. And what Shark is basically doing is just trying to hold Boiler up and make sure he can't just run after the ball. So we'll go for a final round of attacks. Fours with one, and that is, again, two, which will go down to one, which is another momentous one-inch dodge. So we get the point of momentum, and we get the one-inch dodge, which is simply going to move Shark just around to that position there. Now, Shark could potentially heal some of his damage. He could potentially heal his conditions, but that two momentum is looking particularly vital as the game will go forward. So, Shark is instead just going to keep hold of it for now and hope that Boiler doesn't get the killing blow on him next. So we will go back to the Butchers. Okay, so knowing that Shark can't really go anywhere now, Brisket is going to move her 6-inch base move around Ox just to this position here so that she is now engaging Shark. Now remember, Ox is still giving off his own aura, so Brisket is going to spend her one to have an attack on Shark. She has got four dice base, and she is after four pluses with one armor. Launch the dice everywhere, there we go. So, we managed three hits, take one away for the armor is a successful two, and Brisket is going to do a momentous two damage, which will go up to three because of Ox's aura, which will knock Shark down to about six health. So he's not feeling particularly healthy from that. And what it will also do is allow Boiler to come in and potentially get the bonus to go for the killing blow. But we'll go back to the fish and see if they can get the ball towards the goal. So Siren and Angel are probably going to leave their poor captain to it as they try and move the ball up for a future goal. So the first thing Siren is going to do, spend one of the momentum the fish have generated to heal herself for health points. So she's back up to quite healthy nine. She's going to spend influence to sprint her full nine inches, because she is super speedy, to snap the ball too. Now, as you can see, it's been measured out. She's not quite within her six inch kicking range to get it to Angel, but she can get it pretty close. So, to spend one influence to have a kick. So Simon has got three dice. I just rolled four, try again. Roll three dice and gets a success with it which will allow her to re-roll this scatter if she doesn't like it. So I'm going to go green for direction as always. And it's going to go three inches. And it, so it's going to go in the three, six inches, which is basically to there. So the ball path will cross Angel, who will snap it. But there will be no momentum generated from that action. And Siren has one influence, which you can't do anything with, so it'll be spent as she looks over the pitch perilously at the butchers closing in on poor shark holding them at bay while angel makes a roll a run towards the goal so we'll go back to boiler and see what he does next right we're gonna see if boiler can finish the job or at least put some hurt on shark now you can see he's being engaged by sharks so he's unable to charge at him because if you're being engaged you are unable to, to declare a charge if you are engaging someone and want to charge off in a different direction you are fine to do that but if you are being engaged, you cannot charge. So Boiler is simply going to move into Shark. So if we just take this token away, he's going to move into base contact, which, as you'll be able to see, is comfortably within Ox's four inches aura for the owner, which is the plus one damage, and also benefiting from Brisket engaging Shark. So Boiler's going to spend his influence to have a round of attacks. He has got five attack base, and he gains one for crowding. Now... Going on to Boiler's particular traits, on the back of his card he's got something called anatomical precision, which means he gets to ignore a point of armour. So Shark, who would traditionally be four defence and one armour, is simply just four defence for this roll. So we'll see if Boiler can secure a decent damaging roll. So we are just after fours, and he successfully gets three of them which if we look at Boiler's playbook can be anything from the first three columns, but he's going to take the momentous two damage, but it will go up to three because of Ox's owner trait. What's worse for Shark, if he's already poisoned, he's now suffering from the bleed condition thanks to Boiler's crucial artery ability. 
Now bleed is unique amongst all the conditions because it's the only one that goes away by itself, but it's also the highest damaging, which is three points of damage in the maintenance phase. So Shark is on three HP. He's definitely gonna take at least five damage unless someone comes and heals him, but we think it's probably a good chance the boiler's gonna get the killing blow here. So with this final round of attacks, boiler is gonna swing. He has got five dice, plus one for Brisket being there. Fours with no armor because of anatomical precision. And there you have it. He gets two successful hits, which will be the momentous two damage, which will go up to three, which is enough to take Shark out and secure the Butchers another two VP, which brings them up to eight points. And they get an additional momentum for that successful takeout. So you can see, Boiler is a really good kind of finishing player to round off people by ignoring armor and doing that bleed at the end of the turn. That would have killed Shark anyway, but that is a successful round of attack. So we will going to see now if the fish can make Shark sacrifice worth it by scoring a goal at the other end. And that leaves us with the wonderful Angel who wants to make absolutely certain this ball goes in the back of the net. So. She is going to put one influence to use to give herself the super shot ability that we saw earlier, which gives her an extra dice and extra two inches on her kick. She is actually going to move four inches away from the goal. And the reason for that is an ability called tap in. When a player is within four inches of the goal, the toughness of their kick is reduced by one. So rather than needing a four plus to score, she only needs a three, and she's going to spend one of her influence and that single point of momentum to kick the ball. So, she has four dice base on her kick, and she gets an additional one because of her super shot ability. This influence is going to be unspent because whenever a goal is scored, it will immediately end your activation, and we simply need a three plus, hopefully, off these five dice. And she absolutely nails it-ish, maybe. Two successes. It's worth me noting that if that would have been a six, if you get two sixes, you get something called a screamer. So whereas that goal generated one momentum, a screamer would actually generate two. But she got one six, which is all she needs. And actually, you're going to spend this momentum to dodge Angel four inches away, just so she's a little bit further away from the butchers and the pain that they can give just off camera there. And what we're gonna do is we are gonna end the turn and I will kick the ball out off camera and come back to it. Now there will be no need for a roll off this turn. Um, actually there will, but it's almost a foregone conclusion. The butchers have got five momentum, the fish have none. So the best the fish can do is draw. So the butchers immediately get to choose whether they want to go first or second. And I think in this case, they are going to go first. So we will be back in a second with the influence allocation. And here are how things look at probably the final turn, which is turn five. You can see the ball has just scattered out here with the standard scatter from the middle of the goal, near to the butchers, but not in an ideal situation. On the right hand side of the screen, Sir Shark has just came back on with his seven inch move from the back edge of the board. You can see he is taking advantage of the second goal influence that the fish have earned while he is there stat with four. Siren and Angel have both got three influence each. And as for the Butchers, Ox has been denoted the goal influence they scored from Brisket Snapshot. Boyle has three influence and Brisket has one. So we will go to the first activation of this turn with the Butchers having their first go. So this match is very finely poised at 8-8 with the next two points needed to win the game. So the Butchers are obviously going to be looking for a takeout, whereas I think the Fish will probably be aiming for that final third goal. So Boiler is going to go first. And what he is going to do is he could go back and snap the ball, but that realistically gives the Fish a chance to get it off him. So he is the only one within range of Sirens. So he is going to charge at her for two of his influence. So he's got an 8-inch charge and he will make it to this position here. However, Siren, as we know, has got Charmed Male, which will push her defence up to fives, which is very, very difficult to hit for Boiler. 
Now, Siren could spend her momentum to take a defensive stance to increase it to sixes, which will make it really difficult. But the fish are looking to keep that point of momentum that they got at the start, so she's just going to have to weather the blow, which is on nine health, so we'll see how she does. So, Boiler has got five attack and then plus four for the charge, and he is after five pluses. And there we go. So, if we remove the misses as normal, three misses there. Uh, sorry, three. Two successes there, can't even count now, it's got to that stage. Um, that is enough for Boiler to do a momentous two damage to Siren and also inflict the bleed condition on her thanks to that crucial artery trait that we saw earlier. Now he's got one influence left on him so he might as well attack again. So we take away these green dice and we've got a base attack of five. Again, we're going to need fives to attack Siren because she is a charming lady. So, five pluses, and we get the one success that time because we are outside of Ox's aura. What we're going to do is use an ability called Marked Target. Now, this is triggered off the playbook. What this will allow the Butcher's players to do, you can see, clearly see they're going to target Siren, is it will give them plus two inches to their charge. So that means that Brisket and Ox, who are currently both out of range to attack Siren, now will get an extra two inches to their charge if they go for her, which could be particularly potent. So that's it for the Butcher's first activation. We'll go and see how the fish respond next. So at this point, we can imagine that Siren is absolutely terrified having Boiler run up to a cutter and then mark her as potential the final kill for this turn. So she's going to try and get away. So we're going to spend one influence to have a set of attacks on Boiler. Now Siren is going to struggle with this. She's got three attack and she's going to need to get fours with one armor. And actually what Boiler is going to do is he's going to use his point of momentum to counter attack. So if this does not go Siren's way, she could potentially pay with it with a fair bit of damage. So see how she does. Fours with one. And that is bad luck for Siren. She has managed to get one hit, but the armor will ignore it. So we'll go to Boiler with his counter attack. He has got five attack and he is hitting Siren again on fives because of the charm label trait. And look at that, that is four successful hits. Now Boiler has got a lot of choices here. He could go for the two damage to knock Siren down again, but actually what he's going to do is actually physically knock her down with the knockdown trait. Um, and basically what that will mean is Siren is going to be locked to that one inch melee range and be unable to do much about it unless she dodges away. And it'll also keep the ball relatively safe. So that's Boiler's counter attack. And now Siren has got a choice. She can use momentum to heal her knockdown condition and bleed condition, or she can just stand up. Now she's obviously looking to dodge away here, so standing up will kind of make the dodge and then the move redundant. So actually she's gonna to have to spend that one momentum of the fish to heal all conditions. So it will also heal the bleed, but it is spending that valuable resource. Now she knows the boiler can't attack her again with the counter attack, so she's gonna try and go for a second round of attacks on it. Again, we're looking for fours and one. And that is a successful one hit which is enough for Siren to make a momentous one inch dodge. And she's simply gonna to dodge to this position here so that she is outside of Boiler's one inch melee range, but is comfortably engaging him. Now she's got a problem here. She could potentially run and go and collect the ball, but that will put her in a fair bit of trouble. Um, or, she could strike a second time and see if she can achieve something. It is a difficult decision because she doesn't really want to run through Boiler's melee zone. So what she's going to do is going to have a final round of attacks on it. See if she's successful. And she is. She gets two hits that time. And she's going to take a non-momentous two-inch dodge just to this position there. So she is way out of trouble and is also blocking a potential charge route for Ox should he want to come for her. Now Siren hasn't actually technically moved so all she's going to do is nudge herself back onto the wing just so she's a little bit further out of trouble 
and it gives the butchers a difficult decision now on how they're going to try and chase that final kill. So this is where the butchers tend to struggle greatly when they haven't got anything nearby that they can gain momentum from or get any kills with. So we're going to have to go with Brisket here. Brisket is simply going to move. She's got a six inch move, so she's going to move three just to snap the ball and then another three just to this position here. And she's going to attempt to pass the ball with her one, two, ox. So she has a three dice kick and she is successful with that kick, which will generate a point of momentum. However, the butchers are going to spend that to immediately allow Ox to make a four inch dodge. And he's gonna dodge straight forward just to that position there, which forces Shark to come after the ball because otherwise Ox is probably gonna charge him and go for the final kill. So we will see how the fish respond. Okay, so it's gonna come down to this really. Can Shark get the ball and boot it towards Angel for a goal or will he suffer the wrath of Ox. So, Shark has got four influence on him. He is going to spend two to charge nine inches to this position here. So he doesn't cross through Ox's melee range, but he is engaging the big man. Now the Butchers have got no momentum, so there's no defensive stances, no protection of anything here. It is just a straight charge by Shark. So he has got six attack base and he gains his four for charging and he is after three defense on ox and then taking away one armor. So, let's see how he does. Many, many hits there, look at that, it's a fantastic roll. So we take these two misses away and one for armor and we have one, two, three, four, five, six and then another one and this is fantastic because I get to show you what a wrap is now. So, if you exceed your playbook, you again get to wrap around and pick another column. So what this means is six hits is equivalent to the six columns of Shark's playbook. So you can pick anything out of the six columns. He can then wrap around and pick something from the first column. Now we know Shark wants the tackle. So unfortunately out of all those wonderful options, this six is gonna be devoted to the second column tackle result, which is non-momentous. However, when it wraps back around, this result will be used for the momentous one inch dodge. Now Shark doesn't realistically need to dodge just yet because he's got two influence and it'll be a waste to dodge away straight away. So actually he's gonna dodge zero inches and actually buy another round of attacks on Ox. So we take away these green die and we've got six attack and we need threes with one armor again. Oh, many, many hits, look at that. So we take the one away and the armor away and we have four successful hits that time, which will be enough for a momentous action. It could be a momentous dodge, could be a momentous push dodge. And I think that is what Shark is going to do. He's gonna push Ox just straight forward an inch, just to there, and he is gonna dodge himself just an inch that way. And that creates a little bit of separation between the two. And for his final act, Shark is going to kick the ball, hopefully, up the field towards Angel to go for the winning strike. So that'll cost him one. He has a four dice kick, and then we will see where it scatters. So, just put my template on the end there. Four dice kick, is it successful? Do we get to re-roll? We certainly do, because we get a six. We'll use green for direction, as always. And that means it will go in the three five inches, which is pretty much a dead straight run for Angel to go for a tap-in, which is an excellent result for the fish. And it essentially means now the butchers need to go for the kill, otherwise the fish are gonna have a tap-in with their superstar striker, Angel. And it all falls down to big man, big boss, Ox. Okay then, here we go, the main event, and Ox is gonna have to try and defeat Shark from standing. Shark, who is on nine HP, and he's preserved that two momentum, one for the shot and ideally one for the tap-in, but actually, Ox is gonna spend two of his influence to declare a charge. Now, rather than going within an inch, he's actually gonna go base to base, just to give the fish 
a choice here in terms of do they defensive stance to make it harder to hit? Do they counter attack? And then Shark will be looking for that two inch dodge away or he could even do both. Um, and actually Shark is going to spend one of the momentum. So there'll still be one left for Angel to kick to take a defensive stance on this charge. Now the defensive stance only lasts the extent of the charge, not the subsequent attacks, but it will make Shark five pluses with one armor. So we've got Oxes, seven tap base, plus four for the charge. And he is now after five pluses with the point of armor. And we'll see how he does. And actually that defensive stance has helped a little bit there. So if we take the misses away, which is quite a few of them, and that one, and the armor, that is only one successful hit from Ox, which is going to be a momentous one point of damage, which will go up to two because of his owner aura, which will knock Shark down to seven. And that could be absolutely vital. So he's going to have another round of attacks here, Ox. And he's got his seven tap base. And this is where the butchers probably do need to start using their bonus time. So he's going to use that momentum to gain additional attack. Hitting Shark on fours now with his one armor. Oh, and that is a significant improvement. Take these misses away. And one for armor is four hits, which could be a knockdown, but really Ox is just going for damage here. So he's gonna take another momentous result, which is gonna be a momentous two damage, which is up to three which puts poor Shark on four health, so it looks doable. Ox is gonna attack once more. He is going to use his momentum to bonus time once more to get his eight dice. And he is again after fours. And we'll just reroll that. Uh, so, miss, 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 miss. Take that away for armor. Is a successful three hits, which is going to be Two damage up to three, which is going to knock Shark down to his final bit of health. So with this last round of attacks, Ox could take the 10 points, take the game. He got momentum, he's gonna spend it for a bonus time and we'll see if the punching can beat the kicking. So, fours and one. And would you believe that he has actually not got it? Absolutely ridiculous. He has actually missed. I've got a dice down here, but I've just accidentally rolled it over on my hand, but it wasn't that hit. It's actually one away there. Um, that is crazy. So actually, that is no successful hits. Shark has successfully survived the Butcher's Onslaught. What a lucky fellow there with a solitary point of health left. We will go over to Angel next. Absolutely phenomenal. Would you believe that showdown there? And that leaves Angel to see if she can steal the victory away with her captain holding on for dear life. She's going to spend one of her influence to sprint to get the ball and stand well within tap-in range. She's going to spend a second one to activate her super shot character play to give her an additional dice. And she's now going to spend this last influence and that point of momentum that Shark sacrificed his life for to have a kick on goal. She's got four dice base. She gains one for having super shot and she needs a three plus rather than a four because she's within four inches of the goal. To cap off a phenomenal match, will she get it? Oh, and she does. What a successful goal there. And that is the victory for the Fisherman's team over the Butchers. Absolute brilliant match. That will be a final score, We're technically 12, but 10 to 8 to the fish. And we will go to the post-match summary. And we are back, and what a fantastic game that was. Shark holding on until the end, until Angel could just bang in that winning goal. Now, you may have worked out that um, the Butcher's Guild probably would have been able to output a lot more damage in the early turns if we would have played 
their character traits from the start. However, I hope that structured three turn introduction of how the cards worked made it a bit easier to digest. And of course, there are many, many different ways that a veteran player would play that game to actually get more goals and escape. But realistically, I wanted to show you as many different permutations and interactions as possible. So there's definitely more direct ways of playing those teams and far more attacking or goal scoring. But hopefully you got the gist of that really striking team versus a really good footballing team. Now if this has got your interest in the game, I would very strongly suggest that you do invest in maybe one of those teams to start with because they are at the extreme spectrums of the game. If not, you are more than welcome to pick off the kickoff set that Steam Forge make, which has all the widgets, a board, tokens, everything in one box featuring the Masons and the Brewers Guild, who are kind of jack of all trades, master of none. Now, if you are looking to buy a new team, can I strongly suggest you look at our playlists where we cover every single team that is available for Guild Ball. We've even got match reports for all of them as well, and you'll have the cards in the corner of the screen which you are able to use. Hopefully, if you've got any further questions, you are more than welcome to ask them in the comments below and we will get back to you. I suggest you join the Facebook group, it's a really friendly place. And if you've got any further questions or things you're unsure about, the Steamforge forums aren't too bad a place to hang out either. Now, obviously, the main game is played with six players and it is up to 12 points with a full size mat. So if you want to see how that works, again, I can direct you to the match reports or some of our friends who are in the featured channels of our channel. So you can look at them and see how they play the game as well. In terms of Guild War, you can play it very casually or you can play it in a competitive sense. I personally am a very casual player, um, but I've also attended tournaments and they are really, really good fun. So any opportunity to play other people is fantastic. Now the final thing I'll leave you with, if you would like to get a game in or perhaps play it yourself, may I direct you to your local pundit. Now there will be a link below. The pundits are kind of like the unofficial representatives of the game. The Steamforge games the company makes, Guild Ball, uh, has this group who are kind of there to kind of grow the game. Now pundits are available all around the world and they are simply there to give you a demonstration game, to run growth leagues, to set up tournaments and do everything they can to make the game bigger and more popular. So if you find your local one on the map, give them a message on Facebook or give them a shout through the pundit page and see if you can get a game in. I'm sure they will be more than happy to have another player to introduce the game to. So, with all that being said, I hope this has been a really informative video. I've been Tom from Tabletop and Gaming, and if you've liked this, please share it around and drop us a subscription. And if not, I will catch you in our next batch report. See you later.